300 million years ago, Siberia was a waterlogged, swampy bog. 50 million years later, Earth's biggest ever volcanic eruption on land was smothering Siberia in layer after layer of solid silvery basalt lava, hundreds of feet thick. An atmosphere saturated with volcanic carbon dioxide had raised global temperatures by around 10 degrees Fahrenheit. Life on land was dying. Now the hunt is on to uncover evidence of how Siberia's supervolcano precipitated a marine catastrophe in all of Earth's oceans. But scientists aren't looking for answers in the sea. They're climbing 10,000 feet above sea level up into the Dolomite Mountains. Here in the mountains of northern Italy, these rocks give evidence of one of the greatest crises in the history of the planet. Crack open the layered rocks, and fascinating secrets are revealed. Mysterious and long extinct sea creatures called trilobites are preserved in their millions. Their existence here proves these peaks were once a seabed. The trilobites were trapped in sediment settling on the ocean floor. Over millions of years, geological upheavals have thrust them two miles up in the air. The rock layers here are a perfect record of life in the ancient oceans. What we can see is just below the level of my hand, there's lots of uh, nice fossils, a big diversity of things we can find in here. And then these younger rocks just above, just a little bit higher, uh, basically there's very few fossils in here and the much lower diversity. In between the two different layers of life, Wignall hacks into a black band. In here, there are not just fewer fossils. Here, there are none at all. This is what geologists call the extinction zone. It has been dated as 250 million years old. Worrying evidence that having killed off most of the life on land, the Siberian supervolcanic disaster was spreading to the seas. This black clay contains microscopic glittering clues, crystals of a mineral called iron pyrites. Its shiny appearance has earned this rock the nickname fool's gold. It's worth just a few cents, but it holds priceless information about ocean waters where the rock formed 250 million years ago. This mineral, this iron pyrites, will only form in the absence of oxygen. And so, therefore, it's a nice, very direct line of evidence for what's going on at this time. The presence of fool's gold is evidence that the water in which it formed had no oxygen at all. And scientists believe the warming effect of volcanic carbon dioxide from the Siberian eruptions was directly to blame for this lack of oxygen. The ocean circulation is driven by the fact that we have a good temperature gradient. It's cold at the poles and it's warm at the equator, and so you, the water circulates between the poles and the equator like a conveyor belt. But if you make everywhere warm, the conveyor belt turns off and the water just sits there and stagnates and no longer has the ability to sort of resupply oxygen. The ocean had become as still and warm as bath water, and warm water absorbs less oxygen. It's possible to recreate these nasty conditions in a fish tank, in fact. All you need to do with a fish tank is to put it in the window on a bright, sunny day. The sun will warm the water up and the water will start to lose its oxygen and it'll basically it'll stagnate. If you leave it for too long, your fish will die and you'll have a sort of mini recreation of one of the greatest extinction events of all time. As volcanic eruptions tore Siberia apart, Life was fighting for survival in the oxygen-depleted seas. But the Siberian eruptions were about to flood an even more deadly poison into the oceans. To find out what happened next, researchers hunted for a modern-day location that could recreate life in the Siberian-damaged Permian Ocean. Unexpectedly, they found it in central New York State, Green Lake State Park. This unusual little lake is extremely salty and nearly 200 feet deep, making it a model in miniature of the ancient seas. 
we get asked, why do you go to a lake to study the Permian Ocean? It turns out this lake is a lot like the ocean, actually. It's fairly salty, and its circulation system, the process that brings oxygen down deep into this lake, is shut down, just like we think happened to the Permian Ocean. The top layer of the lake is healthy and thriving. But deep down, the bottom layer is stagnant and still. By lowering a water sampler 150 feet down, Kump's diving deep into the past to a time when the Siberian traps were erupting. Well, we have a couple of clues from this water that's telling us about what's going on down there at the bottom of the lake, one of which is its color. And this water is pink because it's loaded with tens of millions of purple bacteria cells in uh, each ounce of water. And the other is the smell. So if I open up the lid here and take a whiff, it's a very potent smell of rotten eggs. And that's a very characteristic smell of hydrogen sulfide. Oxygen is toxic to purple bacteria. So stagnant water is a perfect breeding ground. These single-celled survivalists flourish where other sea life suffocates, but they have a nasty side. They produce a noxious and pungent poison gas called hydrogen sulfide. The tiniest amounts can be fatal. The same bacteria live in sewers, so workers there must carry gas detectors. Hydrogen sulfide deprives your body of oxygen. It's also a strong neurotoxin, so it has that detrimental effect as well. And the really insidious thing about hydrogen sulfide is that it paralyzes our olfactory nerve. In other words, we can't smell it anymore. And that's what's so terrible, because right after you stop being able to smell it, if the level keeps building up, it can become instantly poisonous. Kump's trying to figure out if the same lethal microbes plagued the seas stripped of oxygen by the Siberian eruptions. He's searching for proof in rocks from 250 million years ago. But bacteria don't leave fossils. So instead, he's pursuing the chemical traces they leave behind. So the clues we're looking for are compounds called biomarkers. These are chemical fossils. They're fragments of the organism that have been preserved over long periods of geologic time in these rocks. And from these fragments, from these chemical fossils, we can try to identify what organisms might have been involved in this mass extinction. Like a fragment of bone or shell, a chemical fossil is a fingerprint identifying the microorganism which made it. And Kumps struck lucky. This is it. This is the clue we've been looking for. This is the chemical fossil, the biomarker, that tells us that these organisms were existing at the time of the greatest mass extinction of all time. As Siberia erupted, the purple bacteria were in paradise, vigorously poisoning the water with hydrogen sulfide. The sea became a suffocating, toxic cesspool. The trilobites and virtually every other species of sea life died out and never returned. 